Yes. Okay, so this is the uh, January 19th uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee Engineering Subcommittee meeting. And uh, I need to, it's being recorded and uh, there is a notice I need to read here for everyone. And that is this meeting may involve the remote participation by members either by telephone or other electronic means due to the local public health emergency novel corona coronavirus pandemic pursuant to the provisions of Minnesota statutes section 13.021. All right, so uh, if uh, I don't know if everybody has a copy of the agenda. If you receive the uh, the notice from Millicent, everybody yeah. everybody's looking good on that. Mm -hmm. And Dan, if if I might just jump in for a sec, um, we were talking about this on on email earlier. I, I don't know if everybody is aware. You may have gotten the Gov delivery email, but. Um, if that worked, great, and that's how it's going to be working from now on moving forward. Um, Millicent's been great about getting that set up. Um, the clerk's office asked us to do that just to standardize how the agendas are sent out for all the boards and commissions. So if you have any trouble getting that or you don't think you received it, let Millicent, myself, or Matthew know so that we can help you get on that um, in the future. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm wondering if we might be able to throw up a link to that uh, in the chat just in case uh, somebody needs to refer to it, Chris. For for the agenda? Yeah. Um, sure, I can do that. I don't know if I can add stuff to the uh, thing or not. So anyways, our first uh, order of business today is to do a roll call. And uh, I'll ask Millicent to... Do that, please. Hold on one second. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Aaron? Here. Armand? Are you here, Armand? Brian? Are you here, Brian? That's the right way to say your name. <clears throat> so, Bree. Uh... Bree. And I believe a Sabri's name. Yeah, I saw her name. On, okay. on mute. Well, if you're here, let me know a little later. Dan Booty. Dan Miller. Here. Deanna Newman. Here. Awesome. Is that the right way to say your name, Deanna? Yeah, it is. Thank okay, you. Great. Alyssa. Alyssa is not here yet. Georgiana. Are you here, Georgiana? Greg. Heather. I'm here. OK, hi, Heather. Janice. I'm here. Jennifer. Jesse. Here. All right, Jesse. Joey. John Barrops. Yes. Awesome. Jordan. Cadence. Here. Hi, Cadence. Kyle. Here. Hey. Marty. Are you here, Marty? Matthew Hendricks. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Matthew. Maya. Not yet. She said she might be a little late. Philip. Uh, yes, here. Hi, all. Hi, Philip. Robin. Samuel. I'm here. The, uh, the, this is Robin. Oh, hi, Robin. Wait, hold on one second. Samuel Ferg, you here? Not yet. Steve Elmer. Tyler. Nope, he's not here. Wesley. Here. Hi, Wes. Abdi. Nope. Matthew Deardall. Yep, here. Chris, Chris Carthizer. Here. Millicent Flowers, I'm here. 
Is there anyone here that I didn't call their name? Joey Sankers here. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Joey Sankers. Hi, Joey. Hello. Hi, this is Bree Wickraft. I think you called my name, but I'm new to Microsoft Teams and accidentally logged myself out. <laughs> okay. Hi, Bree. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so uh, this is our last engineering meeting for this term, and uh, at our next uh, general meeting, there will be an election of officers, and uh, everybody is uh, welcome to apply or to uh, take on one of the um, committee uh, co-chairs, the subcommittees, as well as the uh, chair and uh, vice chair and secretary of the general committee. Um, we do have some new members here today, and I would like to just uh, do a, just a real quick round of introductions, make it quick, but just to kind of uh, introduce them to this group, us to them, and I'm going to uh, basically read off of my list and uh, announce you so we have some order in this, and I'll start with myself. I'm Dan Miller, I'm a he, him, and uh, I represent Ward 1, and I'm the vice chair of, of this term of the uh, engineering committee, subcommittee. And we'll go to Aaron next. Hey, I'm Aaron Schaefer, I represent Ward 8, um, and I guess I'm starting my second term now on the BAC. Be Brianna, Brian Whitcraft. On hold or on uh, mute, I think maybe. Hello. Um, my nickname is Bree, um, and I use she/her pronouns. And I represent Ward Twelve, and this is my first ever BAC meeting. Hello. All righty, uh, Diana Newman. Yeah. Uh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Deanna Newman. I work, represent Ward 7 uh, downtown. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. And you're, you're new, correct? I am yes. new. Yes. Okay. And uh, Wesley Durham. Uh, hi. Um, I am the the staff representative to the BAC from the Minneapolis Department of Community Planning and Economic Development, CPED. Um, I've been on the BAC since the beginning of 2017. Okay, thank you, Wesley. And then Matthew Deardall. Hi, uh, Matthew Deardall. Uh, I manage the BAC bike pet coordinator. Um, I've been here at uh, the city for about six years, a little less than six years, I think. Um, and I guess I'm the I'm the voting member of, of Public Works um, as an agency rep. So, I guess clarify that. Thanks. And Millicent. Hi, I'm Millicent Flowers. I'm on the staff at um, Minneapolis Public Works, and I've been working with. Chris and Matthew and the BAC for about three years now. I've been with the city for way too long. So welcome everybody. All right, and Robin Garwood. Hi everybody, I am Robin Garwood. I work for council member Cam Gordon who represents Ward 2, use he, him pronouns. And uh, I have been the council's representative on the BAC for gosh, a long time. I'm not even sure how long. The whole time. And then Heather Gillick, if I say that right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, hi, Heather Gillick. I am uh, with the Minneapolis Public Health Department as an agency rep to the BAC. And I have been on the BAC for coming up on two years now, a little bit uh, shy of that. Welcome. And I have somebody here, Mark Guest, if they care to identify themselves or. 
Uh, well, I know that I'm I'm Mark Guest as I look at the participant <laughs> list, but I uh, it, I'm Philip Music and I am uh, uh, just just recently been uh, appointed from Ward Two um, uh, to the BAC um, and um, have spent the last ten years um, running the state of Minnesota's Sustainable Cities Program, Green Step Cities. Welcome. Yeah. All righty, Forest Hardy. Hi all, I'm Forrest Hardy, City of Minneapolis Public Works and Transportation Planning. Um, here today to talk about Lowry Avenue Northeast along with the county. Very good. And Matthew Hendricks. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Hendricks. I'm the ward rep or citizen rep for Ward 6 and I've uh, been on the BAC for several terms now um, and use he him pronouns. Thank you. And and Liz Hammond. Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Hammond. I'm a senior transportation planner with transportation planning and programming here at Public Works. I'm here today to talk about the Bryant Avenue reconstruction project. And uh, then we have uh, Janice Gepner. Um, hi, folks. Um, I'm the, one of the three uh, Park Board citizen representatives. Uh, I've been on the BAC now exactly 10 years. Um, and I'll repeat what I said at the last subcommittee meeting to the new members. Um, everyone's been new at some point, and uh, you have an important job to ask questions when you don't understand what's going on. Um, because a lot of times things, you know, conversations fly fast, especially the acronyms, and uh, make sure you understand what's going on. Next is Joe Senker. I said that right. Yeah, I'm Joe Senker. I uh, represent Ward 3. I'm a new representative. Very good. Welcome. Uh, John Barabs. Hello, I'm John Barabs with Move Minneapolis, and I've been with uh, BAC for what, a year and a half, something like that. Time flies. Happy to be here. And then Jerome Joyner. <laughs> yep, <clears throat> this is a uh, Trey here. Go by Trey. Um, as, Trey. Go by. You're good. You're good. <laughs> uh, Associate Tracing Transportation Planner uh, and Transition Planning and Public Works. Um, I'm here to talk to you all uh, with Liz about the Bryan Avenue South Reconstruction Project. Thank you. Uh, Cadence Hampton. Hi, my name is Cadence. I use they, them. I will have to update my name because I changed it. <laughs> um, I low plus fall, that's why. Um, and I am the second of three park board representatives. And I guess technically I have been on the committee since mid summer, late fall of 2020 um, in a very unorthodox year. So. Welcome. Uh, Chris Kartheiser. Hi, Chris Carthizer, Minneapolis Public Works. I help staff the committee with Matthew and Millicent, um, and especially um, the subcommittee. So uh, nice to see a lot of you and hear from the, the new folks. Kelly Augusto. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sorry about that. The video wasn't working there. Hold on. Uh, You're now on mute, I think. Hmm. I think that Kelly uh, knocked herself offline. So we'll go to Nathan Coster and come back to Kelly. Hi, Nathan Coster, Transportation Planning Manager. Uh, I'm here to talk about Upper Harbor Terminal tonight. Uh, walking the dog right now, but excited to talk to you guys in a little bit. Very good. Uh, Kelly, you're back. Uh, I am. I'm so sorry about that. All right. Yes, I'm Kelly Augusto. I'm a senior project manager with Hennepin County in their transportation design division, and I'm here today to talk to you all about Lowry Avenue Northeast. Very good. All right. Did... Uh, we talked with Kyle Larson yet? Yes. Um, not yet, but um, I 
I, I think I joined, um, I'm one of the, I guess I'm the third uh, one to go today. I'm the third um, park board citizen rep. Um, I, I joined at the same time Cadence did, so sometime in the summer, I believe. Um, yeah, good to be here. Welcome. Uh, and then we have uh, Jesse Tornson. Hey, Jesse Thornton. I am the I'm a pet bike planner with MinDOT. I am the MinDOT agency rep. Um, I've been on the BAC for probably a little over half a year now, um, and uh, I also live in Minneapolis, in the Northeast. All right. And our last person is a telephone number starting with two six. And uh, does not look like oh, but i don't think they're going to be able to answer right now so now we've made it through the group and we're on to uh uh, uh the bryant avenue reconstruction a 15 up to 15 percent uh in the process with liz Heyman and trey joiner fantastic thanks everyone well i believe we sent through material so i'll share my screen or trey do you want to share yep, yep you already got it trey's on it great um Yep, as I said, Liz Heyman, I'm the project manager for um, the concept design phase of the Bryant Avenue reconstruction project that goes from Lake to 50th. Uh, Trey's gonna start it off here. Um, we'll walk through a couple um, locations and items to do with the design. It's a very long project, so we won't go through every detail with you guys, um, but we'll try and leave it um, as much time for questions as possible. So Trey, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thanks Liz. Uh, so as Liz mentioned, uh, this is uh, 0 to 15% for the Bryan Avenue South Reconstruction Project. It is a 2.5 mile long project uh, to be constructed over two years, 22 and 23. Uh, right now, uh, we're in our third, se second phase of engagement uh, with this project. Um, we introduced the uh, uh, recommended draft proposals, draft recommended proposal on December 10th uh, in our open house then. That was fairly well attended. Um, and now uh, we're at the point where we're collecting a bit more phase two uh, specific feedback on the concept and on uh, certain treatments on the block, as well as continuing to kind of engage with some of the businesses and stakeholders along the corridor. So um, uh, we're anticipated to <clears throat> move towards detailed engineering design and uh, uh, council approval of the recommended um, uh, design uh, um, sometime later this year, this spring. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll, uh, uh, most of the, uh, the year we'll be going through detailed engineering design and then uh, constructing in 22 and 23. Uh, we don't know which uh, portion of the quarter will be constructed first, um, as that's something that's kind of uh, hashed out um, uh, through that kind of detailed engineering design uh, portion of the project. So uh, Public Works has uh, several goals uh, that we um, have set for this project that are reinforced or uh, set forth by our city policy and our vision zero action plan, our draft transportation action plan, our complete streets policy, and um, the declaration of climate emergency here in Minneapolis. So those goals are to improve pedestrian safety and comfort. Um, Bryant doesn't have uh, any boulevards along the corridor. Um, it's a street that was built 60 years ago. Um, now people are using it in a much different way. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we, as we proceed with the um, design for Bryant that we're accounting for uh, those those current uses and those future uses. Um, also, um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, but uh, Bryant's a pretty prominent uh, bikeway, and so uh, one of our other uh, uh, main project goals is to uh, create an all ages, all abilities bicycle connection. Um, and the bicycle connection on Bryant goes from uh, Lake to 50th, well, at least for the project it does, and it continues uh, further on um, north up to Franklin. Um, but you know. This is just for the portion from Lake to 50th. Um, and so that all ages bicycle connection is essentially designing a bicycle facility that uh, is uh, more comfortable and uh, more usable uh, by a wider range of cyclists, not just those who are most comfortable with traveling in lanes. So these are um, uh, typically children or, or bicycle riders who don't ride more uh, as uh, frequently or uh, older uh, folks. And so also we're supporting existing future transit in the area and Liz will talk a little bit more about that as uh, she kind of goes over briefly goes over the proposal to move transit to Lindale. And then um, uh, we're also uh, using green infrastructure to collect and treat stormwater runoff. Uh, this is a rather new goal for a reconstruction project um, to have on the outset 
Um, but I think with the opportunity we have to redesign Bryant for the future and add in boulevards and add in a uh, number of other treatments, we want to make sure that uh, we have this uh, on the forefront of our uh, priority list as we're moving forward. And then also, um, of course, Bryant has five business nodes that you kind of see on the, the map here, and they um, also have needs. And so we understand that we must uh, accommodate businesses, uh, their deliveries and customer access as we're moving forward with the design. So uh, some of the design considerations, um, just a quick uh, overview of uh, what um, Bryant, what we have to work with essentially is that Bryant has 60 feet of right away generally throughout the, well, it does have 60 feet of right away throughout the corridor. But generally that right away is uh, constrained to 55 feet in many places. And uh, this is primarily because of, as the picture illustrates, uh, stairwell encroachments or retaining walls or trees or fences. Public Works have the policy to not take back that right away, uh, particularly because it's expensive and um, kind of just, uh, it kind of uh, holds up the process for moving forward with a reconstruction project. And so uh, we generally uh, work within that effective right away, but in places where we can expand to that full right away, we do so. Um, and um, we can kind of go over some of the blocks where th that is occurring um, further down. Um, so some other options that uh, Public Works considered uh, as we were, you know, were move forward with this, uh, moving forward with this project was squeezing it in, <laughs> squeezing bikes, transit, and, uh, and, and cars <laughs> on, on Bryant. Uh, and that's essentially just, putting back what's there now. Uh, we found out that the squeezing in option didn't leave a lot of room for um, um, addressing some of those public works goals that we had with adding in green infrastructure, improving pedestrian comfort. And so it just left us with minimums across the board and in some cases less than minimums, which is just not in policy in line with what we do on a reconstruction project. Um, uh, the other one, that, the other option that uh, we're, we're moving forward with um, and that was what we proposed uh, the draft recommended proposal on December 10th was bikes on Bryant and moving transit to Lindale. Um, that's primarily because we we understand that there's a limited amount of space here and on Long Bryant and we want to make sure that uh, we're building to that all ages all abilities goal but also uh, supporting transit where, where, where possible. Um, and then <clears throat> the other option we looked at uh, which we um, kind of ruled out because it didn't meet some of our um, goals for the project was a uh, transit on Bryant um, that required moving bikes to an adjacent street like Aldrich. The impacts of that is that um, Aldrich doesn't have the, the exact amount of space uh, uh, we would need to build an all ages, all, uh, all ages, all abilities facility without removing a full lane of parking and still dealing with some of the uh, more uh, troublesome uh, bicycle connections at, um, at Lake and, and 50th. And so we got all the problems with uh, with uh, moving bikes to an adjacent corridor without a lot of like benefit. And so that's kind of how we're landed. Uh, we landed on the, the bikes on Bryant option. And so this is just kind of explaining exactly what uh, what I just mentioned to you all about uh, the the those trade offs between um, uh, those three um, three options we considered. But also we added in two other stakeholder priorities. Um, these are maintaining vehicle access on Bryant and maintaining on-street parking. These are common priorities that didn't align with our project goals, but we understand that <clears throat> in certain places, uh, mainly some of those five business nodes and other areas around the corridor, that um, <clears throat> there's a need for um, uh, uh, contextually right amounts uh, of, of parking and, and access along the corridor. So we've added those in into the uh, our draft recommended concept. So um, kind of don't briefly go over stakeholder outreach. Uh, I mentioned this before. Uh, we did our first phase of outreach um, in spring of last year, where we presented the existing conditions along the corridor. Um, we had a survey that we posted on our website. We um, flyered the the neighborhood and the adjacent area, excuse me. And um, we also posted a wiki map, um, and we had our, our open house. Uh, that was, in, as I mentioned, the spring of last year, and. Um, from then on till December 10th, um, we kind of collected <clears throat> and uh, uh, analyzed that information and we posted a, a recap of phase one on the website. Um, there's a detailed section and there's a, a less detailed section for those who just kind of want to skim over and I, I recommend it's a really good read. Um, and then and on December 10th, as I mentioned, with our open house, we uh, posted the same material, well, similar strategies for, for sharing uh, uh, input or sharing uh, the, the concept with with uh, with stakeholders. Um, 
was um, posting a, a more a detailed wiki map where folks could look at the corridor concept, uh, comment on that, um, a survey um, that uh, accompanied that, and then we're also kind of continued our outreach to businesses, and we still took in like emails. Um, so kind of what we heard uh, from all that outreach uh, over over last year and, and continuing what we've we've done this year is uh, we've heard that we want to, the public want to improve the bicycle facility. That's a um, um, a main kind of uh, common thing that we're we're hearing. Um, and then also think about what that would uh, if we could make some changes to traffic signal timing. Um, also concerns around combining bikes, cars, and buses on the same narrow street. Um, we're kind of you know addressing that a bit when when we're in our proposal to not consider the the squeeze it in option uh, there. Um, also, we've heard I think this has uh, been rather 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 uh, uh, common and, and very like um, loud. I, I would say from the amount of feedback we received is slowing vehicle speeds and traffic calming along Bryant. Um, and as you uh, as we dip into the, some of those cross sections, you can see some of the treatments that we included along the corridor to account for that. But also maintaining vehicle access and parking, as I mentioned, and then calls for green infrastructure, boulevard, shade, uh, water quality infrastructure, and then uh, the need for cross treatment intersection control, particularly for bikes and for um, 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 pedestrians, and additionally for for, for vehicles in, in some locations, and then um, concerns for pedestrian accessibility and safety. So we've had a we've heard a wide gambit of of input and. Um, I think with the draft recommended concept and where we're headed uh, with um, our, our revised concept sometime later this this spring, uh, I think we're addressing a lot of these. Um, so, on to the next one. Um, so these are some some of those design features that uh, we're we're kind of go a little bit more into. There's bump outs. We've included chicanes in places to slow vehicle speeds and calm traffic. Um, green infrastructure uh, where we had the boulevard space to accommodate it. And then reducing parking in uh, locations around the corridor uh, where we uh, have uh, uh, the opportunity to do so. So, Liz, did you want to take it over from there? Sure. So, um, it was a high level overview of kind of like policy setting and guidance and how we've gotten to this draft proposal. Um, did want to highlight just a couple blocks um, before we kind of throw it open to questions. If you guys have specific questions about any of these things, I want to echo Janice's advice and um, please, you know, jump in if you have questions or don't understand something. Uh, there's a lot of material here, a lot of technical jargon. We tried to get as much out as possible, but um, do please ask questions. But um, Trey, can you head to page? Um, seven for me at this document. Um, so as Trey kind of navigates there, can you zoom in to um, like the second, the second, um, yeah, those two blocks, 44th through 42nd. Um, so one of the main bicycle um, design choices here for Bryant that we're showing in this draft proposal is that south of 40th, um, we're currently proposing a shared use path. Um, it's a 10 foot shared use path. Um, the reason we're doing that um, is based on some of our data and our land uses and how we expect um, numbers to be in this section of Bryant. Um, that's one reason. The other, the other driving reason is so we can get some of those really wide boulevards that you can see there. Um, if Trey wants to zoom in on those, I want to say some of those are eight feet up to, and they're really wide in that section, which is great. So that's one of the big um, the big benefits of this, yeah, 14. Um, so it's it's pretty unique um, to be able to get that much space, and it's really important for our green infrastructure goals. Um, so one of the rules of thumb um, for designing in green infrastructure is that the larger amount of area that you have to work with, the larger um, you'd be able uh, to treat. So, um, oh, we lost my shared use path. Oh, yeah. You want to head back to 43rd for me? Um, <laughs> And so I was going to use the intersection of 43rd and Bryant just because of an example of how we're trying to balance all these needs within the right of way. Um, so those are familiar with the corridor. Um, this is a little um, business note there. It's also, yep, there we go. Thanks. Claire Barton School um, up there right north of that number. I guess it's not really north. Above the, uh, the number three there you can see. Um, so a lot going on here. A um, couple things to note, as Trey mentioned, in this section, we are working within our effective right of way. Um, but what we found 
through all of our work is that at our business nodes, we can expand out. Um, so you'll see there as you kind of move from, so where the number nine is, and then that's actually, it's like moving north towards number seven. Um, we can, at these business nodes, expand out. So the shared use path, and we add a little bit in of sidewalk here to separate out the places that we know will have um, the most pedestrian uh, uh, traffic. So we were happy that um, we got to make that adjustment. Um, you'll also see here that there's kind of multiple configurations. So just south of 43rd, we're showing parking on both sides here. So it's um, to support the existing business needs there. Um, further south on the corridor, we're actually showing um, no parking. Um, and we did look at parking needs on a block by block basis, um, trying to make sure that we could accommodate um, parking in during the peak period for each block, either within the spots that you see um, on Bryant itself um, and along with spots that we know are available on um, the existing cross street. Um, other thing to note is that as you're looking at this very long <laughs> corridor, um, most of the things that you see are can be kind of traded out um, with other blocks. So if you see something that's interesting on one block, we can most likely put it um, in another location, um, you know, driveways, um, you know, et cetera, notwithstanding. Um, so that's one big design, like overarching design choice. Um, if Trey, you could head to page nine for me, please. So north of 40th, um, we are um, in this proposal recommending that we separate the bicycle. Oh, I think we lost Liz. We'll give her two seconds to join. If not, I'll pick it up. Oh, ready? I think we lost her. So yeah, um, what Liz was going to say is like north of 40th, uh, we've um, we've got the room to in many places to separate the bicycle facility um, by expanding to that full right of way uh, in many cases to get that um, that that space needed to um, account for the increased activity um, north of the north of the that 40th intersection. We know that um, looking at our bicycle accounts that uh, folks are traveling much more um, by bicycle along this route. In addition, there are a lot more um, uh, locations and, and businesses and other modes traveling as well. And so um, given though that increased activity from all modes, uh, we thought that um, it's best to separate the bicycle facility out here to provide that increased comfortability um, and in, only in some locations um, will we is that increased width to the bicycle facility and the sidewalk um, <clears throat> compromising how much space we get in the uh, the boulevard. Um, as we scroll further up, let's see, give me a moment as we go further. There we go. So doo -doo -doo, here we go. What I mean by um, the space that we need to separate the facilities uh, may compromise the space that we have on the adjacent boulevard on the other side of the street. Um, the block between 36th and then up to uh, 35th is an example of that where we have no boulevard on the um, left side of the street. Liz, are you back? <laughs> yeah, that hasn't happened yet. First thing for 2021, I got my internet reset in the middle of speaking, so apologies for that. Um, <laughs> Um, Did you, were you just running through that block right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. just talked about um, um, separating the separating the, the bicycle boulevard and the, and the sidewalk and uh, where that compromises where, where, where we would have boulevard in some portion of the corridor. Fantastic. And did you um, maybe just head up to the very northern blocks where we have like the most pressure? We can kind of talk about that. So as Trey kind of navigates there, and I apologize, I hope you can hear me better, kind of happen on my headphones on my phone. We'll see if this works better. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to note um, with this group is that in this northern section of the corridor, and maybe Trey already, already mentioned this, is this is where we see kind of the most pressure on the right of way, where we have the highest needs. So we have the highest need for um, parking all day. We have the highest uh, amount of bicycle and pedestrian counts. Um, we have the highest uh, vehicular counts. Um, and one of the things we also found um, through our work is that we have um, some really large opportunities to invest in green infrastructure. But as you'll see, as maybe my phone's lagging a little bit, there we go, I think it's there now. Um, 
you'll see that we don't have boulevard space um, on both sides of the street here. Um, and, and we just can't fit it all in even, um, even when we're removing one side of parking. Um, and so one of the things that public works is discussing and is interested in feedback. And if you head to our website, um, you can take our survey, um, is we are looking at the potential for a one way for some or all of Bryant. Um, and I just wanted to kind of leave the, the Bryant, uh, section here with that is that we're, we're trying to fit everything in that we can, um, but we know this is still a very narrow right of way and still difficult to meet um, all of our goals um, within this section. Um, I think the other really important part of this project is that we are proposing to move transit from Bryant to Lindale. If you head to our um, project website, you can see where we're proposing those locations. Um, as Trey mentioned, one of the big things here is that there's just more room to work with on Lindale. Um, we've done traffic modeling. We've shown that we can make this work um, with, with the transit, local transit service um, and the typical amount of peak period congestion that we see on Lindale. Um, response to this, we've heard you know concerns about how buses will move, but also a lot of concerns about um, pedestrian safety uh, on this section of Lindale. Um, this is a section that is, you know, has, um, has boulevard in the middle. Uh, it's two lanes in each direction with um, pocket turn lanes. Um, there's, but there's still a lot of concerns, especially at those unsignalized locations uh, for how pedestrians can cross. Um, and so one of the things that we're excited about with this project is that we would have the opportunity to invest um, in uh, pedestrian medians at the places where we are recommending bus stops that also don't have a traffic light to help people cross. Um, I think we hit the high points, Trey. I'm going to stop there and kind of throw it open to questions and I'm going to try and join on my computer again so I can see people's hands. <laughs> awesome. Okay, um, we're going to uh, try to have a conversation. There's a few people that have raised their hands and that's a feature that is sort of in the lower center that you can click on that if you're having a hard time getting into the conversation. I'll monitor that and try to get everybody uh, a chance to speak as we go through it. So we're gonna start with Robin. Thanks. Um, just two, uh, two quick questions. One is south of 40th, where you kind of had bumped out um, the shared use trail condition to create a little bit of sidewalk space at the commercial nodes. I didn't see a width on those. What's that width? I want to say it's six feet, but I'd have to double check at each location. But we did have the amount of, um, it was a full sidewalk. So I believe it's six feet at that location at 43rd and at the other business node. So 50th as well. Okay, thanks for that. And then the second question is, if we did go to one lane, uh, uh, one way would which direction would that traffic go do you think sure great question still under consideration to see what those impacts would be um working with our traffic colleagues to come up um with what our recommendation would be um a lot of work to do on that idea still um we're mostly just floating it for um to get like early feedback so we don't we don't have a recommendation yet for whether it would be northern or southern uh, in terms of the one way for traffic flow, vehicular traffic flow. Great, thanks. Okay, next, Janice. Um, I was just going to say, if it's one way, presumably it's just one way for cars, but the bike facility would still be two way. Correct, correct. Um, that's a really good point. So we have heard from folks that are interested in traveling, you know, at faster bicycle speeds. Um, that um, some people don't feel comfortable biking on um, a, a path um, like we're showing here. Um, and so the bicycle facility would still be two way, but if people were interested in using the street, whether that be on their bike or in a, definitely in a vehicle, the street traffic would be one way. Okay, I might be a little bit out of order here, but I'm going to go with Philip next. Philip's music. Um, yeah, so a, a couple of questions. Um, has the city experimented anywhere with permit? I'm thinking about uh, uh, parking bays, parking spaces um, to try to add some uh, infiltration capacity. Um, experimentation with permeable uh, concrete or asphalt. 
So I know that there's been a lot of experimentation done um, by my colleagues over, over in, in, um, in engineering and design, but I'll say that this level of, um, of detail, so what we're in is called the conceptual design phase. We don't make those types of um, materials decisions. Those yeah. get figured out yeah. during detailed design. Um, so one of the big things we're trying to do here is carve out space um, for green infrastructure. Um, and so permeable pavers, that was standing. One of the best ways that we know we can do that to treat the most amount of water is to ensure that we have wide boulevard spaces. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's been experiments, but um, we won't get into that during, uh, we won't be making recommendations during this phase for materials like that. But good sure. question. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, next is Aaron Schaefer. Hey, um, thank you. Hey, um, I wanted to, before I say any comments or questions, I just wanted to say as someone who was just a few blocks east of Bryant, um, it's exciting to see this and thank you for all your hard work. Um, one thing that I just really wanted to talk about, just kind of as a pedestrian more so than a cyclist, but also involving just general safety is right at that 43rd and Bryant intersection. Um, and it kind of is the root cause of a lot of my concerns with Bryant is uh, through traffic from people. Right now, people can travel by car all the way from Franklin to 50th without having to detour or take any other route. Um, and so, so you, what you end up doing is getting a lot of speeders, a lot of people um, who just seem to be in a hurry. Like they're not, they're not neighborhood people generally. And, uh, and so what you see as a result of that, especially at 43rd and Bryant, for whatever reason, right at Clara Barton School, is um, people rolling through stop signs, both on 43rd Street and on Bryant. And uh, so one suggestion I had was to look at um, speed tables or just, just keeping um, those bikeways level and then possibly to cross Bryant also having um, the pedestrian crosswalk as a, as a speed table type of thing too. Um, yeah. And oh, sorry. just kind of considering that just in general, I guess that's some of the more key intersections. Yes. Um, I, I'll say that at um, at those intersections, we are at every intersection where the bikeway crosses, right? So on the um, on the east side, um, after kind of conceptual design, we will be looking at race crossings. We know that's really important, especially with the two way. Um, I'll say that we're learning from our past projects. So I was the project manager on Johnson and on Gerard, um, where we at the outset thought that would be a simpler thing to do in terms of um, of construct construction scope. And yet when we got out there, we found that to tie in to the grades to make that happen, um, it, it was just much more complicated than we thought. So we're trying not to overpromise on this one, trying to learn from our past mistakes of how we've talked about this. But yes, we are looking at um, at, at level crossings and, and raised crossings for the bikeway. The the raised crossings and, and 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 your point is well taken specifically at Clara Barton. Um, the raised crossings are trickier to handle um, on Bryant itself because Bryant is a, a municipal state aid street. So to get those grades to get those tabled crossings is just much more challenging to meet our guidelines. Um, but I'll say that's a that's a good point at that location. Um, and, and kind of bring that back to the design team to see what we could do. I'll say yeah. overall, though, we really think that, I mean, this cross, the, the street is going from 40 foot curb to curb to like 22 um, across in most in most of these locations. So we're, we're really thinking that narrowing up this street that drastically, especially in the locations where we know um, parking isn't used today. And so it really feels really wide open. Um, that will be able to take care of a lot of those speeding concerns through um, that design choice, uh, along with the chicanes that we're um, recommending on almost every block here. Okay. Hey, quick follow up to to that, which maybe you may have just answered with your state aid mentioned, but one other suggestion I had was to just to try to eliminate some of that through traffic. Is that to look at somewhere between um, Lake and 50th having a diverter or a closed median um, just to force someone to uh, 
to not use it as a through route. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll say that you're right. <laughs> I kind of did half answer that one with um, state aid makes that much more difficult. But I'll also say that, um, you know, Bryant, it's kind of this in-between street as we've been talking about. It's not truly a residential street, even though it's very residential, not truly a commercial corridor. It's really this like in like, like a hennepin. Um, it's really this in-between. And so given that we, and given that we're, you know, also trying to support business access and um and accessibility for customers diverters make that really challenging um i'm sure you guys know trying to kind of um, navigate some of the neighborhoods that have diverters um is that like I, I just end up avoiding it almost completely because i can't ever remember what the route is and so if we're trying to support and continue to have bryant be a walkable mixed use um corridor public works at this point doesn't think that diverters is is the right way to go um, to help with that issue. Um, so it's kind of like a two-part answer for that one. Okay. All right, and then we have Jesse Thornson. Uh, yeah, I just had like a, a minor comment to make. It seems like there's a couple spots where there's the the 10-foot um, trail back a curb, and then there's also a um, driveway apron located there. Um, and so uh, the making it that great difference between the street level and the sidewalk slash trail level, um, it seems like that that path is going to be much narrower than 10 foot at some of those locations. I think to the left is one example. Um, uh, if you go a little bit further left on the page, I think there's an example of, um, yeah, that one right there. So just trying to be cognizant of making sure that the actual usable width of the trail is consistent um, right there. It looks like there may be a little bit of a pinch point. Yeah, absolutely. A um, couple things on the driveways. Um, we have heard a lot of, of feedback and concerns about the driveways. I'll say that it was a communication choice to show the driveways gray through here. Most likely we're going to um, be having it be the same like trail color, whether that be asphalt or concrete. Um, some of our most recent trails have been done in concrete, but the so first the priority will be given to the cyclists here with the material as well as making um, making sure that we keep that um, bikeway as uh, level as possible through all those through all of these locations where we do cross residential driveways. Um, I'll say the communication choice was made to show this so you can see the driveways because People get really stressed uh, when they don't see their driveway. We didn't want people to think that we were closing their driveways, which we are not. Um, but very good point. I mean, in some of those locations, uh, the one you the one you have there, it is challenging. We're going to do our best to make sure that um, the trail stays as as level and at the same um, height as possible throughout this uh, whole corridor. Okay, Matthew Hendricks. I had um, one quick detail following up on Jesse's and then a couple other general comments. So the quick detail for that driveway in particular, I wonder if it would make sense to remove the parking immediately north and south of the driveway because the parking would obscure people going in and out of the driveway. And then that might create enough space to deal with the grade change there. Uh, and then in terms of general comments, I was really excited about this project and the direction you're taking. Um, there are several things here that I think are a really big deal. Um, moving the transit to Lindale is a huge, um, I think, benefit to the project and a big piece of what makes it possible to make it uh, so attractive for bicyclists. And then uh, having parking on only one side of the street is a big deal. Um, that's not always an easy thing to uh, to get or, you know, as a starting point. So that was really nice to see. Um, the frequent use of chicanes was really good to see. And then finally, um, getting the street width down to 22 feet in many places and 28 feet uh, where there's parking on one side is a really big deal as well. So I, I wanted to kind of step back or, or zoom out a little and really thank Public Works staff for presenting such a fantastic project that I think um, could be a really kind of a model for a lot of other reconstructions for similar kinds of streets. So uh, a huge thank you. 
Thanks. That's super nice. Um, we're also really excited about this project and what we think it can do to set a lot of precedents um, in design. You mentioned the, the street width. Um, we have some exciting things coming up on, on Lindale. Um, and yeah, so thanks for the compliments. It's very nice to hear. Um, specifically though, at 46, you're right. We should look at that. Um, we can see what that trade-off looks like. I'll say that at that location, it is another little business node. So we were trying to get as, um, you know, parking close to there to kind of continue to support the way those businesses operate today. But um, that's a good point about the driveway access. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to get need to be uh, moving along here, and I've got just uh, one quick, two quick comments. Um, the, the one would be, uh, Liz, maybe this is coming in more detailed design, but will the intersections on the trail uh, have zebra crossings uh, on them in addition to possible tabling? Um, so at the moment, Public Works' policy is to, to stripe crosswalks for trails where we have a raised crossing. So since we are not at the moment, um, you know, saying that all of these will be raised, mm -hmm. um, we would, we are showing them without striped crosswalks. Um, we do have all of our signalized intersection that have crosswalks, um, but at the moment, if none of these were to be raised, they would not have zebra crosswalks at these intersection sections. I really appreciate uh, the idea of uh, making the color or the material uh, consistent along the uh, the uh, trail so it reads as a trail rather than the uh, series of drive lanes that are going through it. I think that's great. And I think also the uh, whether raised or just a zebra crossing across intersections really helps alert drivers that there's activity there. And uh, so, um, but anyways, Liz, is there something that you wish this group, uh, you ask anything of this group before we close? Um, at this point, since we're not, you know, making that recommendation um, and we're we're going to be having um, four rounds of outreach just because core is so, so large with the addition of Lindale. So to really give it its due, we're we'll be coming back sometime in March or early April um with with another draft so i'd say at this point not looking for a recommendation from this group or um or anything like that more just information sharing i'd say check out the website to leave comments um but yeah we'll we'll be back probably two more times uh to this group before this project's over very good thank you liz there's no more questions and dan, dan sorry yep. to jump in um i i have been hearing it I'll just um, start by saying Matthew's entirely right. Um, this this represents a lot of big steps forward and staff should be absolutely commended. Um, I've also been hearing a lot of um, chatter from folks who feel like the the facilities being proposed are are maybe not as wide as as we would like them to be um, and and a lot of support for this idea of the of the single, lane so so a single lane um, one way um, strikes me that that's probably in our interest as a as a committee to to be supportive of that um, and so if we're in the middle of a process um, where that that um, feedback is being sought why don't we go ahead and just say so so i guess that's a motion um, from me that we would support uh the the at least exploring this one lane one way so as to free up more space for pedestrian bicycle and green infrastructure on bryant is there a second to that i think i would i would second that can i double check who's tracking that is like mill center you're tracking that to or Dan, will you get us that language? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm tracking fast notes. So okay, good, thank you. Yeah, it'll be. Uh, I'll rewrite it as we go, Robin or Robin. If uh, this passes, maybe you could uh, put together some language for it. Sounds great. Okay. Can do. All right. Uh, any discussion? Uh, do we have to uh, do a a roll call on this or dan i see phil with his hand up yep phil um 
Yeah, I don't know, Robin. I mean, it it is pretty intriguing, but I, I also feel like, I mean, I know the court, I bike it fairly often down to uh, 46th, and, and I'm also thinking about Linda. I, I don't know. I, I, I am sort of intrigued, even though it feels like a, a squish in it in all the, actually all the, the driveway, driveways make me a little nervous, but I think it, I don't know. I'm not sure I would support it because I feel like it's a, there's enough creativity in dealing with the two ways. And then we're going to be sending probably some traffic over to Lindale. We're going to have buses there. So mm. I, yeah, at least those, that's, those are my initial thoughts. I'll just say, I, I'm also intrigued. I'm not, you know, ready to completely go to the mat for the idea, but um, there are places where we have kind of sort of effectively done this. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and and it seems to work pretty well. Um, now, none of them have been exactly the same as this context. It also seems like it maybe would go to Aaron's comment earlier about some kind of diversion of of traffic off of Bryant, um, which is not really intended to be the kind of through route that that I think he's right that at least some people are are using it as. Um, it seems like the direction of that traffic is going to matter a lot, which is why I asked earlier. And so I, I think um, we'll we'll be able to get more of a sense of like what the residents along there and what the businesses are supportive of. But it 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 also does just. I mean, I've I've heard people um, who are pretty concerned about the width of the of the bike facility, about having a shared facility, about there's still being places where there aren't boulevards and it strikes me that we could get out from under all of that if we just had that additional 10-ish 9-ish feet to play with on the entire corridor so at least let's like look at it i kind of i i would agree kind of with that um especially like with regard to not having a feet through way um and you could even do something where like at it's southbound to 36th street and then northbound to 36th street from 50th um something like that but uh but also just kind of going along that um i've i've also heard a lot of concerns about the width of those paths and i i think maybe right now like today it's sufficient but as we're trying to shift the modes and expand cycling in the city um building a 50-year corridor to to hold some of the future traffic um some of those eight foot two-way bike lanes maybe won't be sufficient so it is worth um thinking about how to make that 10 or 12 feet all right uh so this is a motion from the subcommittee that uh if it would pass it would go before the uh general uh BAC in next week where it would be voted on again and Robin would be writing up the language for it. Do we need to do a voice? I mean the uh, roll call on this Melissant. I was going to ask Matthew, do you think we should nope. vote on it if we don't have language? I don't believe so. Not for a uh, subcommittee anyway, so. Do we need a voice vote? I, I think we can keep it casual because it's not a, a full meeting. Okay, so it's five o'clock. So I'm just going to say all in favor. Signify it by aye. 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 Opposed. OK, so it's five o'clock. We've got three more projects to roll through. Thank you very much, Liz and Trey, for a, a great presentation and the great engagement that you've been doing on this project. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you. everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. All right. The next up is the Lowry Avenue Northeast reconstruction at zero percent uh, with Forrest Hardy and uh, I believe uh, Kelly. Kelly August Augusto. You got it, Dan. Hi. Yeah. Thank you all for having us here today. Um, here to talk about. Lowry Avenue from Washington to Johnson Street and Northeast. Uh, it's a 2023 construction project, so we're just at the very beginning of uh, design and engagement at this point in time. So without uh, stealing your thunder anymore, I'll kick it off to Keller Augusta. 
No, that was a great setup. Thank you, Forrest. Um, I was thinking I would just share my screen with the slides that were submitted with the agenda. Um, is that showing up for folks to see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, that's wrong. All right. Um, so I'm Kelly Augusto. I work for Hennepin County in their design division and am the project manager for the county for the Lowry Avenue Northeast reconstruction project. Um, so I'm just here to introduce the project or maybe reintroduce the project to you and give some higher level information on kind of where we're kicking things off here. Um, so the phase that we'll be talking about tonight is uh, the first first of two phases that has received funding. Um, it's about a one mile long segment along Lowry Avenue Northeast going from Washington Street Northeast to Johnson Street Northeast. Um, and Central Avenue is sort of centrally located in this segment. Um, then uh, some items to note that will be uh, reconstructed with the project are pavement, uh, curb and gutter, storm sewer, and traffic signals. Um, I believe there are four signalized intersections within this segment. It'll also include improvements for corridor users, including updated ADA accommodations, sidewalks, facilities for biking, and streetscape enhancements. Um, a little of the project background. The, the project started with uh, some pretty extensive public engagement and a study uh, that culminated in the Lowry Avenue Northeast Corridor Plan and Implementation Framework uh, in 2015. And that study is available at the link in the slides that were provided. Uh, the study was adopted by the Minneapolis City Council and then the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners in 2015 as well. Um, and so that's kind of been our uh, starting point for our work with the preliminary design of, of the project. We're looking at the recommendations that came out of this corridor plan and implementation framework and looking at um, looking at our options that way. So the next slides show some of those uh, recommendations, um, kind of splitting the corridor in half. So the study had recommendations for the roadway, how the roadway could look east of Central and then also west of Central Avenue. Um, so east of Central Avenue, uh, the study looked at having a two lane roadway with on street bike facilities and wider sidewalks. Um, and then the study also included a uh, view of the existing roadway and what the proposed roadway could look like in a in a segment of it east of Central Avenue. So uh, this view I, that we're looking at, I believe, is supposed to be around Polk, Polk Street. Northeast and Lowry Avenue Northeast. And then. So west of Central, the study had um, recommendation had recommended to have a three lane roadway um, with wider sidewalks. So the. The rendering kind of showing what that could look like. Um, and then that would. So three lane, a three lane roadway with wider sidewalks and also boulevard space. Um, generally, the the corridor that we'll be working with will be attempting to stay within the existing right of way as much as possible. So it um, there's a lot of elements to look at and a lot of options to consider here, but the the recommendations out of the study were have been a helpful place to start for sure. Um, and then I put in some traffic volume information 
um, that's also available on the Hennepin County Multimodal Counts map, and the link is um, provided in, in the slides, but it, if the link isn't a smart link, I can provide that again. Um, so from 2017 volumes that the county has available um, west of Central Avenue and east of Central Avenue, the, the numbers are shown there for your reference. Um, and then the project schedule. So uh, regional solicitation or federal funding was awarded in 2018 for this project. Um, preliminary design is just kicking off now and we would anticipate it going through mid to probably fall of 2021 here. And then detailed design would start up at, at that point and go through approximately the end of 2022 with construction beginning in 2023 and likely going into 2024. Um, we have done a little bit of community engagement because uh, I've been invited to the Wyndham Park Citizens in Action Neighborhood Association meetings on a couple of occasions already, um, along with um, also, Oliver Smith from the city has attended those with me as he is really involved in the um, property acquisitions that have been ongoing in the Central and Lowry Avenue uh, intersection area. Uh, but future engagement will be starting soon. Um, we're working to secure a contract with a consulting firm to assist the county in doing some um, community engagement throughout the course of the project. Um, so that uh, we would hope would be kicking off uh, very soon. And that's all the information that I had prepared and I can open it up to questions. It looks like there may have been a hand up already. Uh, yes, Kate, I mean uh, Janice. OK, um, yeah, I just ha have a quick question, but I also want to shout out to I noticed that Sierra Schlichting, Schlichting is at this meeting and she used to be chair of this committee, um, oh. the subcommittee. Anyway, I just my question um, is I didn't know that it was is the city still putting in bike lanes that are un unprotected? Maybe there's a question from Matthew Dudo. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's a that's a oh, sorry, interesting. The walk, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting and complicated question. Um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Let, let me. Well, it's not a it's not a city street, right? Um, so I mean, I think that that's an important part. Um, I think our what what our transportation action plan notes. Um, we we wouldn't typically. The idea it's brand new, but the idea going in is that we wouldn't put. Um, you know, standard bike lanes in on new reconstruction projects, um, but on, you know, maintenance projects like a resurfacing or a, or a seal coat, um, we, we will consider consider those. Uh, but again, this is not a county, um, or this is not a city street. Um, it, it's something that piqued my my interest too, and, and I'd be curious to talk more with the county and, and you all what you think about, about it as well. Because what we would um, the difference the difference in the reasoning is is that we wouldn't consider that to be a low stress bikeway for you know all ages and abilities um, because there's no separation from cars. But again, that's just like responding to the question and and just uh, seeing this for the first time. So, right. Thank you for responding to that, Matt. Um, Forrest and I have talked about that a little bit um, in what we would aim to look at in, in the initial concepts that that we're developing now. So um, having some sort of separation is something that we would look at in, in our concept development. OK, and then we have Jesse Thornson. Uh, yeah, one thing I just wanted to kind of note to make sure it's not um, overlooked is that on the um, the plan for the Johnson reconstruction, 
there are two notes on there that are associated with this project. Um, one of those notes is uh, for the trail that's on Johnson. It says trails and trail narrows to six feet will be widened with Lowry Avenue reconstruction project. And then uh, it just says, and it also says that the future Hennepin County reconstruction project will improve the Johnson and Lowry um, intersection. Um, so I've, that's always been kind of in the back of my mind, waiting to hear um, when when this type of project comes up. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned it. Sure. Thank you for mentioning that, Jesse. Yes, we we have been coordinating with the the project on Johnson Street as well, um, and our project does include the intersection with Johnson Street and Lowry, uh, so that that is going to be part of our project. Uh, next is Aaron Schaefer. Hey, um, I just had a quick thought on this, just kind of looking at your study recommendations um, to try to widen those sidewalks. Um, but then also these smallish unprotected bike lanes. I think, I guess what I would consider um, or ask you to consider is, uh, is possibly expanding one side to be a mixed use path um, and then narrow, maybe narrow the street even more, um, but then add, add some extra feet to one of those, just one side of the sidewalks. That's a good that's a good comment, Aaron. Um, it wasn't something that was looked at in the 2015 study and talking to um, staff in our office who were involved in all of that work that was done. So yes, I think that's something to consider. Cool, thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is Dan Miller. Um, I'm uh, this is in my ward and I I'm very familiar with the uh, the study and uh, in the project and uh, the area. Um, a question for you is uh, the uh, this plan or the Lowry Quarter plan uh, west of Central uh, put the bike lanes on 22nd and 27th. In other words, uh, they moved them to those two locations. Uh, the 22nd Bike Boulevard has been around for a long time and it's a very, very popular route. 27th, uh, has not been improved. And uh, last year, a lot of this area, a lot of the Holland neighborhood uh, had a blacktop uh, resurfacing, but they skipped 27th. And uh, I've got two, a question and uh, just a comment. Uh, one is, uh, this is the 2015 plan. And I know there was some thoughts to um, go back and explore uh, whether there was a possibility of maybe adding a, uh, multi-use trail like Aaron is talking about between uh, Central and Marshall, uh, since there's not enough room there to put it in right, not enough room to put bike lanes on the street like what is shown here. And the other comment is, is that if that is not a possibility, will we be fast tracking uh, improving 22nd and 27th? So the, uh, uh, these have these bike boulevards get updated uh, similar to the Queen Bike Boulevard and the Penn Avenue discussion. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I can speak to the question on the shared use path idea. I, I see that being a, a possibility or definitely something that can be explored mm -hmm. from a, a concept level at least. And I don't know if maybe Forrest can help speak to the questions on looking at possible other bike boulevard improvements. Yeah, certainly, Dan, there's other um, bike boulevards in the area, um, probably serving maybe a different use than a facility on Lowry would do. Um, 27th was uh, upgraded to a protected bikeway between Marshall and University uh, a couple years ago. Um, but I don't know exactly, you know, what arrangement would take place between city and county if there ended up not being a, a bike facility on the western segment. Um, there would certainly be conversations at that time um, as to whether an, an alter alternative facility would be improved. I know it was expressed uh, as a possibility a, a year and a half ago, and I'm just, uh, since uh, this did uh, receive uh, regional solicitation grants based on bike lanes, uh, bike facilities being added, whether it's on 27th and 22nd or Central or a Lowry, I, I just think it's important to push on that and to make mm -hmm. sure that's not forgotten. 
Mm -hmm. Dan, um, I'll, I'll add uh, that 27th Ave is on the, you know, the higher priority uh, AAA network in the Transportation Action Plan. Um, so while, while I don't know that there would be like a, as direct of a connection between Lowry and 27th as there was on Penn and Queen, um, you know, may, maybe maybe this effort could maybe maybe it could help us like bump it up in the list or or whatever. But definitely, it's a priority over the next ten years as identified and tap. Matthew Hendricks. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would urge the county to look at uh, keeping the bike facility uh, west of central or, or building it into the project west of central um, partly because it's a really um, helpful east-west corridor that would tie into the bike lanes on the lowry bridge um, so it would provide some continuity rather than having a lot of sort of scattershot of hey if you're biking you can bike on lowry here but over here you've got to cut south three blocks and then cut back north three blocks at some point you know guess guess when you can um, so to to just kind of provide a sort of straightforward level of service to bicyclists to have this corridor have bike facilities makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the other thing is I think a lot has evolved since 2015 in terms of understanding about what types of bike facilities are most attractive to bicyclists and are safest. And so uh, I hope the county doesn't, um, doesn't feel to, like overly tied to the specific recommendations of the 2015 plan because of all that we've learned since then. Um, so I'd hope that at a minimum we'd have curb protected bike lanes uh, throughout. And uh, in the sections where you're looking at a three lane configuration, maybe explore whether three lanes are really needed everywhere or if that's more of a selective center turn lane and in other places you can use the space more effectively. So those are my comments. Thank you for considering our feedback. Thank you for the comments. I appreciate it. Uh, since this is at 0%, uh, do you need anything from us, Kelly and Forrest? This this kind of follows um, the Bryant Avenue presentation and, and is meant more for information at this point, I think. How about you, Forrest? Uh, no, nothing at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there's no other questions, uh, we'll move on. Thank you very much for this presentation. It's we're very hopeful to see this uh, avenue get tamed. I appreciate the time today. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have the Upper Harbor Terminal 10% with Alexander Cato and Nathan Koster. Hey, thanks, Dan. Um, can everyone hear and see me? Yes. Yep. OK. Um, I haven't been at the, to the BACPAC in a while. Do I just share my screen and talk through it? I'm assuming that's a yes yep. as well. Yeah, okay. yeah that yes. works. Alexander. I'm pulling it up right now. Just give me a moment. <clears throat> OK. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, all good. Yep, we okay. can. Um, I have a few, so I'm going to run through this presentation. I'll try to be as concise as possible to give um, space for folks to ask questions and comments. Um, on the call as well is, is Nathan Koster. Um, Ciara from Tool is on the call, and I believe Ahmed, our engineer, is on the call as well. Is that correct? I know I see Ahmed and I see Ciara. Okay. I'm going to hop in. Um, hold, let me just pull up my presentation again. OK, um, so this is 10 percent um, design concepts. So these are still just proposals. Nothing's been finalized. Um, we've been um, just starting to share these with community. We have an open house next week as well. Um, and I'm just going to dive into them. There's a lot in here. And how much what's my time limit, uh, Millicent? Um, this is Dan. It's okay. 530 or 520. Yep. And uh, we're going to give you up to 545 if we can wrap it, wrap it up. Hey, actually, Dan, I, I've got the last piece and it's really short. So Alexander, feel free to take a full half hour. Um, okay. 
I, I probably only need five to ten minutes. Okay. Um, guys. I'll try to be as concise as I can to give folks on the call a chance to ask questions. Um, so Upper Harbor Terminal site, this map highlights um, just the general area. Um, you'll see this blue line that really highlights the true Upper Harbor Terminal site. Um, but when we do projects like this, um, this is maybe one of the first we've done that since I've been at the city. But when we do larger projects, we always try to think about the network, right? So how are people getting to from the site and then traveling within the site? So obviously Darling Avenue is going to be a really big east-west connector. Um, and then from the north-south, kind of that Washington 2nd Street North, and obviously crossing Lowry as well. So we thought about all these pieces as well as the Grand Rounds, um, the Weber Camden Parkway as well, um, to provide a really comprehensive network. Um, this highlights the actual infrastructure for the project. So the blue line highlights um, Dowling Avenue North, um, I think about a year ago we added it to the CIP. It was originally only going to be um, just this blue section here, um, but we added in um, the reconstruction up to Lindale. Um, so this will be reconstructed. Um, and then I think in 25 we have this going all the way to Thomas. So we're going to continue the treatment even further west um, to get closer to the Theoworth Parkway. Um, so the blue is Dowling. Um, phase one of the parkway is this green that'll go in in 23. Phase two is on um, TBD, but likely in 2025 or beyond. And then also part of uh, phase one improvements is 33rd Avenue North. So these sections, the yellow, the green, and the blue represent about a mile of infrastructure. Um, so that's going to be the roadway and then the underground utilities as well. Um, pretty typical with all of these, we're always going to try and prioritize our most safest prioritize the safety of our most vulnerable users, which are pedestrians and cyclists. We want to make sure we're bringing in public transit and also really trying to provide a, a riverfront oriented experience uh, with this development and the accompanying infrastructure. Um, not going to get too much into this today. We'll come back to you at 30% and show you more of the public realm pieces around utilities, um, but we are um, developing water and sanitary for the site and also working on uh, stormwater plans as well and either a district or regional system to treat stormwater. So district would be um, just the UHT site area. A regional treatment would treat stormwater um, outside of the UHT site. Um, stormwater is just all the runoff that comes from um, storm from rain, from ice melt, et cetera. We want to capture, treat, and convey that before it's just charged into the Mississippi River. Um, the images here are just a few potential examples of treatments that we could show. Um, not a whole lot here, just providing this to you all as a, as a sense of scope. When we come back in March, we'll have um, a bit more robust examples as well of, of potential options for that. Um, phase one is upper dowling. This is our proposed conceptual design. So this is you're kind of, I would say like Lindale's right behind you and you're looking east across the bridge into the site. Um, and on, on the next slide, I'll show a, a, a better cross section, but you can see here in this proposed schematic, uh, we'd have a sidewalk on the north side of the street. We'd be taking the existing bike lanes on Dowling and taking them off the street. I don't know the exact daily traffic count, but I think it's, it's upwards of 15,000 vehicles a day, which is a lot. Um, and as you all know, when we're in situations where we have high volume roadways, we try to take our cyclists off the street um, if we do keep them on the street, we try to provide physical separation with curb protected or bollards. Um, in this example, we have a shared use path because we're in a very constrained right of way. Uh, so this is Upper Dowling. This is the conceptual image 10%. You can see we have a, a six foot sidewalk here, uh, varying boulevard width, uh, another boulevard on the south side, a 10 foot shared use path. We reduce the travel, um, the travel lanes as well. Um, I'll just leave this here if, if folks have any questions on upper dowling. Um, and just, yeah, does anyone have any questions on this? I can keep going through the slides, but I don't want to get too far ahead without giving folks the chance to comment. I see none, uh, no hands going up, Alexander. Okay, but we can come back to these too. So I'll just, I'll just keep running through these. Um, 
So with this treatment on the south side of the street, shared use path, like I said, we have a really constrained right of way. We're not, you know, we're not taking away any property, so we're trying to play within the space we have. So we're, we're recommending a shared use path treatment. Um, the 2025 reconstruction in the CIP will go from Lindale to Thomas and will likely have a continued treatment as well on the south side. So this would be very similar to what exists on 26th Avenue North, which is about a mile or so south of here. Um, the difference with that treatment is that it's on the north side of the street. Um, there's a bit of different coloring of the um, driveways and things like that, um, that we would, um, you know, a few lessons learned in terms of how we treat our driveways and how we color designate them. Um, that would be different in this option, but a, a similar treatment um, and then there'd be a continuation of the treatment across the bridge. I'll talk about that in a second, but you can see um, some striping here to, to give a cue to motorists um, that pedestrians and cyclists have priority and to yield. Um, as we transition to the bridge, uh, this is Dowling Bridge today. Uh, I'm sure many of you have walked across it, walked across, cycled, driven across it. Um, you know, it's it's a tough situation. You know, it's it's not the most comfortable pedestrian environment. Uh, we are in conversations with MnDOT in terms of potential improvements that could occur. It is not in their current timeline for improvement, so we're trying to work through um, when improvements occur. How does it line up with this project? Uh, a potential option that we could consider being viable at a minimum would be a baller treatment, which is uh, similar to what's on 26th Avenue North. Um, this option in this image is on the north side of the road and this it would be on the south side of the road. As you can imagine from Upper Dowling, you have the shared use path. You're going along this whether you're walking or biking and then you would continue that across the bridge um, and then you would continue it all the way into the site. Like I said, this is uh, what we're, we're saying is the bare minimum. Um, we're still exploring um, further refining that and, and turning it into something like this. You know, a more artistic railing, um, a more uh, beautified uh, physical separation piece, but we have not finalized any of those details yet. Um, it's still an ongoing conversation with MnDOT. Um, any questions on that before I go into lower dialing? Okay, I'm going to keep going. And Dan, if there's any questions, if you could just cue me in, I'm presenting so I can't see um, anyone's yes, face yes. <laughs> or any. Watching, okay, watching the hand raising. Yep. Thank you. Um, so this is low. So we're calling this lower down. So upper Dowling is the kind of the Lindell Dowling area. It's at a higher elevation. Lower Dowling is once you cross the bridge and you kind of go down that slope, you enter into what we're calling lower Dowling. Um, if you've been to Washington and Dowling, you know um, how challenging it is as a, as really any transportation modal user. Uh, I believe on a previous presentation I did on this topic, there was a member on this call that was actually struck when they were cycling in this area. So it's, it's definitely you know near and dear to us. Um, we know the challenges that exist. Uh, this is our proposed concept. Uh, tough to see here, but we have um, fixed the skewing of the intersection, so there's a bit more of a linear movement. Um, we're adding in that continued shared use path. In this example, it is actually just a bike path, and I don't want to say just, but we are providing a separate sidewalk um, for pedestrians here. And then the two-way bicycle facility would travel east-west into the site. Um, we are adding in some truck aprons as well to accommodate some of the larger truck movements. Um, this is a really challenging intersection because there is a lot of large vehicle activity. Um, this area of North Minneapolis is still largely industrial from a land use standpoint. There is a lot of industrial uses north and south of this area. I think over the next few decades with the implementation of Upper Harbor Terminal and other developments, it'll start to change. Uh, but the reality is that there are a lot of trucks that use this area, and we had to put forth a design that accommodated those, but still prioritize our cyclists and pedestrians um, and other users. Um, I'll just leave this here if folks have questions on. Oh, and one other comment. I'm, I'm just going to say one more thing, and then I think there's a question. Um, we are um, proposing uh, another shared use path on the east side of, of Washington. And the thoughts are that this would connect south to Second Street North and then also north into the uh, Weber Camden Bikeway project. 
um, so that we were providing some more north south um, bicycle con connections to folks coming and going from the site. Uh, was there a question, Dan? Yes, there's a, a question from Jesse Thornson. Hey, yeah, Alexander, um, I would I would encourage you to um, pursue the truck aprons on the on and off ramps um, as well. Um, I have been working those into some of our projects and uh, getting some receptive reception to that some positive reception so i would just uh maybe pursue those a little bit and then we can work those out later on okay that, that's a great comment um i do have ciara on and i think i have heidi on as well from our design team just want to make sure you all are capturing those comments and if you have any any additional feedback for jesse around that Hi, this is Ciara. Um, I would just say that's great to hear. Um, we've been working with MnDOT, but we haven't been working on designing the ramps um, so far, but our team is doing a design charrette this Thursday, so it's good to know that truck aprons should be in play uh, with the ramps as well. Moving on. Um, so this is, you know, like I said, remember for folks, if you're, I, I guess I'm hitting on the biking and walking a lot because that's kind of how I get around a lot and this is the right committee. But, you know, if you're here, you're continuing along Dowling, you're walking or biking um, and you're continuing on this treatment on the south side, it continues here and then it also continues into the site. Uh, this is a conceptual design. I'm sure some of you may have seen this in the coordinated plan. Um, which is out for public comment right now that CPED is leading. Um, but you see this this two way bike facility. You see this uh, pedestrian sidewalk here. You see a lot of uh, land use activity occurring. And this treatment really is that gateway that as you travel into the site, um, you know, ideally you're doing it in your preferred mode. Uh, you know, comfortably you're enjoying the scenery um, and you're getting there safely. And then you come into the site this is the parkway this is it's a lot to digest um, we're still kind of working through a lot of the development pieces and i'm just going to zoom in here um, it's a little tough to see i don't have the most high resolution image but that treatment that i talked about is right here um, there's a rail crossing here um, to make it more fun, we have active rail crossings on the site. Approximately four times a week, uh, a train travels through here, so we have to accommodate that movement so folks are able to get in and out safely. Um, and then you come into the site, and then you enter the parkway, and you can go right and travel down the parkway to the south, or you can go north and travel down the parkway. Uh, here is going to be uh, the park. There'll be development here, development here in the music venue as well. Um, then we have a cul-de-sac to the north and then to the south we also have a cul-de-sac and this concludes the phase one developments. Um, Ciara did a lot of work on updating this. Um, Ciara, is there anything I'm missing at a high level from the parkway image? Yeah, I would just add <clears throat> that when Dowling intersects the parkway, the idea that is that would be a completely raised um, intersection. And so it really says, hey, car, you are now a guest and this is really a human um, scale place. Um, so I would just add that. And then also um, there will, you know, be a riverfront trail through the park and there will be um, as you're biking down Dowling and intersect with the parkway. If you look closely, it looks like it, it's a dead end. It will not be. Um, it will continue down um, to the riverfront trail system. And this is a bit more of an illustrative <clears throat> image of the parkway. This was also in the coordinated plan, so you may have already seen this, and it was um, shared on a, a lot of different uh, media sources. Um, so this is the, the two-way um, travel road for vehicles. It has that red granite chip surface that you see at a lot of park facilities, um, a separated two-way uh, bike facility for those rollerblading, skateboarding, et cetera. And then the pedestrian has the, the prime real estate in terms of their experience. They're the closest to the riverfront um, and able to really kind of enhance that experience. So. I think in my second slide, I had those bullet points of goals and, and you know, provide, providing a riverfront oriented experience um, was one of those. You can see it here with the pedestrians and cyclists. Um, these land uses kind of reflect the southern piece of the site a bit more where there'll be some of that light industrial. So just if you're trying to orient yourself, we're on kind of the southern part of the site. 
Um, you can see some active boat uses there as well. Um, phase one also includes 33rd Avenue, so this will be our secondary access point. Um, if you've been on 33rd Avenue, there is a really old street uh, with no sidewalks and definitely no bike facilities. Um, and so with this design, we're going to put in, you can kind of see it sketched here, that, that shared use path on the south side of the street. And it would come into the site here, and this would connect into phase two of the parkway. Uh, there's also a roundabout here as well. Um, a lot of the light industrial over here will be utilizing this area um, to turn around vehicles um, and access a lot of the uh, shipping freight needs over here. Um, to make it even more fun, we have more rail crossings here. We have three sets of rail crossings that we'll be designing a treatment for um, to ensure that um, folks are safe and can get in and out of the space um, avoid it and then avoid conflicts with um, with their active rail line. And you can also see here Second Street North is in here and that'll be another north south connection. Um, we're not reconstructing Second Street North, but we are starting to think about just scoping in um, potential potential modifications to the existing bike facility so that it's a bit more direct, um, safe and comprehensive. Um, this is just a little bit of information on the railroad crossings, a potential example. This is on Humboldt Avenue North um, and is a, a potential design that could be incorporated, although we have not finalized that yet. Um, and then I'm just going to go into the engagement timeline and then I can open it up for questions. Um, so right now is January. We're at our 10 percent. Um, we have we've had focus groups. Our open house is next Tuesday. Um, we're going through that process, you know, simultaneously working on integrating public art into the infrastructure um, and we'll be coming back in March with a, with a 30 percent design. So we're on a really compressed and tight schedule and Heidi and Nathan have been really managing that and um, Heidi's on the call if you have any um, questions on kind of the overarching timeline. She's been very meticulous in, in pushing us along and making sure we meet reach these deadlines. Um, to a council layout approval in that August September time frame. So by the end of the year, we should have a, a finalized 30% plan. Um, and then I'm just going to open it up for questions from from members of the committee. OK, we've got about uh, let's see about 10 minutes and we'll start with Janice. Um. Actually, maybe other people recall better than I, but um, when this uh, project was presented to our other subcommittee this month, Alyssa, who's not here tonight, uh, was concerned. She had read the whole plan in detail and was concerned about a par large parking structure that she was wondering why it was being added at phase three and what the, the purpose of the parking structure was. So there are more people here tonight than there were at the other meeting, and I was wondering if you could explain the logic behind the large parking because she was concerned that that's not consistent with um, the city policies about reducing um, car traffic. So I can just give a kind of general overview on parking. Um, there's a there's a lot of pieces to it, but it is a great question. You know, what what is, what is going on with parking? So the coordinated plan calls out um, a few parking locations. So uh, well, let me take on the parkway. There will be a few. Um, parallel parking spaces, so I think let, I want to just bring that up first. Um, you can kind of see a proposed concept here. Um, we have a few parking spaces here. That's really um, to provide access to the park. You know, maybe that's a few dozen at most. Um, the parking structure would be proposed in this area here to accompany the land use developments. Um, they propose, I believe it's a 420 stall underground parking to accommodate a lot of the land uses there. Um, that is part of the coordinated plan. That has not, um, once those developments are near the completion, they will go through the formal city development review process um, where they go through the assess the amount of parking they have um, and that determination is made. So that has not been finalized yet. I think that's what you're referring to, Janice, just that kind of parking piece there. Yeah, it was the uh, the big parking structure, the mm -hmm. parking ramp, I think, like for four, four or five hundred cars, she said, something like yeah. that. Four hundred and twenty cars. 
Alexander, I can jump in and help out with that yeah. one. Uh, Janice, good question. So last month we came through with CPED to discuss the coordinated plan. It's a, been a multi-year planning effort that CPED's been leading in close coordination with the community. And that was speaking more towards land use. And we wanted to make sure the BAC and PAC had an opportunity to both understand that and provide comment for the, open, the public comment period for the coordinated plan that's more specific to the development and land use. We're here today to talk about more of the infrastructure. So Public Works has less say and control over the specific land uses. So a lot of those comments would be have to be directed towards CPED and the planning effort, uh, since we don't really have much authority over how the land use is exactly going to be planned. So I, I know it's two complicated back-to-back -to -back topics, infrastructure and then the, the, more the land use planning, but there's two distinct topics that we were trying to uh, help increase transparency because we were know we were coming back um, in two consecutive committee meetings. Okay, next we have Philip. Uh, yeah, Alexander, can you remind us again? Uh, uh, jumping back to the beginning of the upper dowling segment, so it's a, sh a shared use bike ped path two two way bicycles. So so how many how many feet total then? Um, let's see. So this there is. What it would look like, you know, just schematically, and then the actual width is ten feet. For two lanes of bis bicycles, both ways and pedestrian. Correct. Ten. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Next, we have J Jesse Thornson. Yeah, I just wanted to check in on the the roundabout that was shown. I'm I'm kind of guessing that that was more of a conceptual layout not necessarily what the final layout would look like uh, my own my concerns with that one it looked like the um the entry path radius and exit path radius were especially the entry path radius um uh fairly fairly large so the the fastest uh vehicle path through there um seemed like it could be fairly fast across that crosswalk so just uh maybe another um uh look at that just to make sure that the um, vehicle path radius are 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 uh, small enough so that there's enough horizontal deflection for um slowing down the vehicles across there yeah that was a, we got a comment from i forget who gave us that comment but they also asked this design speed of their roundabout um and okay. it's a good catch um it is definitely just a schem it's just a conceptual design and we would be designing it to a much lower speed um, I can't give the specifics. I didn't design it, but to your point, yeah, we definitely want to discourage through design vehicles going through there at unsafe speeds and all the conflicts that can come with that. Thanks. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Thanks for these. I'm I'm really appreciative of seeing uh, those bridges getting softened, and I I hope that. Uh, you can break through with uh, Minda, and hopefully they can soften the rest of the bridges that uh, run down the, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, from this all the way down to Plymouth. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a plan to uh, improve the second and Lowry intersection. It was a county project. Are there any updates on when that's going to happen? You know, it's basically getting from 33rd and uh, using second and being able to get to Broadway. Dan, the latest I have is that project's been put on hold indefinitely, but the county would be the best to have an update, but that's the last I heard is like a month ago. Hmm. It's too bad. The other comment that I have, and this is something that uh, just picking up off the uh parks for all uh program and uh the encouragement to work with the city on uh uh the, you know its transportation action plan and to incorporate stuff that trails that go in between the, the parks and the city um, i am not seeing anything about orientation kiosks uh some way to understand where the heck these things go and I think that uh, that's, I know that may not be in your particular purview with this, but I'm thinking it's more than, it's it's a regional park kiosk that really could really help out people get from the Grand Rounds using Dowling or 
to get over to the Weber Park or to get down to uh, West River Road. And uh, I hope that's that is being uh, someplace uh, captured to have more than what we have had. Yeah, Dan, it's a great comment. Um, there's, I think, a few things to it. Uh, first thing that comes to mind is when I am traveling on the Park Board's uh, regional system, they do a great job of providing those kiosks. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine that those would be included in here since there will be a NPRB park in here, and especially since there is the understanding of connecting into the Grand Rounds. Um, within the site, um, from a city standpoint, I think that's a great point because the infrastructure is so massive and the scale is so large that providing some level of uh, wayfinding makes a lot of sense um, and ties in with a lot of the feedback we've heard from community members around art they want and just place making and, and just general navigation. Um, so that, that's a great comment to, to provide. We will incorporate that feedback. To the north of there on 57th, there's a, and the park, basically uh, the, the regional trail, there is a, a kiosk that intersects where the Twin Lakes Trail and the and uh, the North Mississippi come together, and some some kinds of treats treatments like that all the way up and down this thing, uh, mm -hmm. I think might be very helpful to make sure we're capturing. We have a, a question from Bree Whitcraft. Hi, um, I was wondering, Alexander, for. And this it might just be in general, but this back to the roundabout, um, mm -hmm. it looks like a pretty large roundabout um, compared to um, past roundabouts in Minneapolis, but maybe it's just <laughs> the screen um, size on the presentation. However, I was wondering, has the city ever considered doing underground roundabouts? And making sure that you know the traffic of cars go underneath, and then people and bikes can go above, so there's no interactions. I just see a lot of conflict points with those crosswalks. Yeah, I, I know that concept comes up quite a bit. You know, just land use bridges separating pedestrians and cyclists from motorists. So it's it's definitely not the first time I've heard it. Um, I don't know if the city's ever really truly explored an underground um, infrastructure piece like that. Um, usually they tend to be really complex from an engineering standpoint and then cost wise they tend to be very challenging. Um, I think sometimes they're, yeah, I don't want to say it's, I, I don't think it would be a viable solution in this example, um, but it's, yeah. I, I don't know, Nathan, if you have any other examples to pull from on kind of separating um, peds and cyclists from motorists through overpasses and roundabouts and things like that. Hi, Bree. Good question. Uh, just framing up what we were trying to, what are some of our goals were is we knew that there was going to be phased implementation of the parkway. The whole parkway wasn't going to be built at once. We're trying to maintain access to GAF on the southern side of the site, as well as the industrial parcel that Alexander was referring to without dead ending trucks and a small cul-de-sac. So looking at both the short term and long term, uh, the team decided to pursue a roundabout. Uh, in this location, uh, but I think Jesse had brought it up previously and it'll be one of our primary points is designing a safe roundabout focusing on those crossing points where there are conflicts as well as making sure it's designed at the appropriate speed since this will be one of the key gateways to the riverfront. Yeah, that's what I was thinking just because it's so close to the river um, and then I just uh, feel like it sets a, a good precedent for the city because this project is already so expensive um, to add a line item. I mean, yeah, it's an engineering feat um, and it, it, they're pretty cool. <laughs> or or vice versa, you have, you know, the pedestrians and bikes uh, go underneath as well um, as an option as well, especially when you mentioned the truck traffic um, there. Okay, I see no more questions and we need to uh, get on to Chris. Um, 
is there anything you need from us, Alexander? We'll be back to you all in March. Um, my contact info as well as Nathan's is here. Um, so you can definitely shoot us questions in the interim. Um, but thank you all for the feedback. Um, and you know, we're excited to, to keep moving this project along and, and working with CR and Heidi and others. And yeah, this has been a fun one, complex, but a good one. So thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, uh, we'll be moving on to Chris Kartheiser and the uh, Lindale Avenue uh, uh, safety project. Thanks, Dan. Um, I am going to still try to keep us uh, on time and get us out of here by six o'clock. This is a 0% um, presentation, so this is the first time that I've brought this project to this committee um, and really bring it I'm thinking more as kind of a courtesy. Um, it's a pedestrian safety project. There aren't any bicycle facilities on it. A lot of times we still like to bring these projects to the BAC at 0% um, so you all can see it. And perhaps there's something I, I missed. And if you all have any um, comments from a bicycle perspective, such as any east-west uh, routes, you'd like to see the connector or anything like that, um, definitely don't hold back. If you have um, pedestrian things that you'd like to throw out, I'm Chris, we've lost your sound. I think you might can be you back hear me now. now? Yep. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, what I was saying is uh, we this is a federal project. We were awarded regional solicitation um, funds for this, and this is also a municipal state aid route. So for folks who have been around a little bit longer, you know that, that potentially adds a few constraints on, on some of the uh, designs here. Um, so that's something that we'll just be considering uh, as we go through this. But overall, this project is a 2022 construction and it is a retrofit. So we're looking at seven different intersections along the uh, Lindale Avenue North. Uh, so this is in North Minneapolis between 22nd Avenue and 40th Avenue. And um, in some regard, it's, it's a relatively um, basic project in, in that we'll be looking at some of the standard things that uh, a lot of you are familiar with, such as curb extensions or bump outs, um, a pedestrian median. Um, we'll be updating all ramps to be ADA compliant as we go through. There's there's one current um, signal out there, uh, a flashing beacon at 27th, which I can just um, zoom in quick here. Uh, to 27th is at Farview Park here, if you're familiar with that. And so th there is a signal there that we'll be looking to likely upgrade to um, an RRFB, a rectangular rapid fra flashing beacon. Um, and some other stuff that we're looking at um, is potential kind of chicane design bump outs. Um, so traffic is really fast out here for anyone who's experienced this corridor. I've been out on it a few times and it's uh, immediately apparent that the average speed is well above 30 miles an hour. Um, there's one lane in each direction on this road, and I'll, I'll zoom in just so you can kind of see again a little bit here. Um, it's one lane north and southbound, and then on the southbound side to the left side here, it's a parking lane. And the, in my experience, that parking lane is not very um, parked up most of the time. So it just feels really wide um, and, and cars use it as such. Um, I, I, I don't have data on this uh, yet. We are, we are getting a speed study, but I, I'd say like 40 miles an hour easily. Actually, I think we did get our speed study back in the 85th percentile was right around 40 miles an hour. So, um, so the average speed is well over the speed limit. There have been vehicle, pedestrian vehicle crashes on here. There have been four fatal um, crashes on this corridor in recent history. And so we're, we're really looking at slowing speeds and making it easier for pedestrians to cross this corridor and feel comfortable moving along this corridor. Um, there's just another zoomed in picture there. And then this is all just kind of repetitive stuff that was shown on the previous um, spot. But 
Um, I'm going to leave it there. If there is any desire for me to come back to this committee, I'm happy to do that. Um, that said, I know that we have a lot of engineering work coming through, um, much of which is specifically bicycle focused. And so um, I don't necessarily need to, um, but I'm happy to. I also am not looking for a resolution today. Um, but again, if you feel so inclined, I'm happy to take that for what it is. So I'll, I'll take questions and it looks like Dan just uh, put his hand up. Yeah, uh, I really uh, like what the uh, temporary setups are, the uh, the Lindale uh, flasher and uh, just going up and down on this side. This is a uh, tough avenue. My question to you is, is how has the community responded to this and uh, have you started much public engagement on this? Thanks. And, um, and yeah, I'll touch on that first part. So uh, I actually worked with Matthew and some other folks to do a quick build um, uh, treatments that Dan is talking about. So we went out with just bollards and paint and added some medians and some bump outs along this corridor, which was just uh, part of the Vision Zero um, work and lined up nicely with this to kind of test some of our things out early. Um, so I'm glad you like those, Dan. Yep. Um, and then as far as community engagement, um, no, so so I, I haven't I haven't had um, I haven't gone in the neighborhoods yet. That's that's upcoming. I've spoken with the council members about this and plan to touch base with them again um, soon here, and especially as we start to get some designs. But I, I have not had uh, this is sort of the beginning of the of the process for public engagement. And that said, um, when I last spoke with council members, it, it was. Uh, it was a few months before the end of the year. And as we all know, uh, North Minneapolis, like many of our communities, but especially North Minneapolis has been dealing with a lot uh, with the pandemic, um, with the uprising this summer. Um, there's There's been a lot going on. And so um, just entering into public engagement, being aware of that and knowing that the capacity to deal with different types of projects there the community members here are being asked a lot um and so we're going to try and offer as many ways as we can to engage with folks if you all have ideas or connections i'm i'm absolutely happy to uh hear about those and and try and do that i, I plan on working with the council members to see what the best approach is uh, and and with other, with other groups as well. And then just one other question is uh, the section that is also Vision Zero south of Broadway that was planned to be done uh, this uh, fall didn't happen. Is that still on schedule and it will it happen next spring or is that going through uh, kind of adjustments with kind of our last year of uh, issues? Matthew, if, if if you know, that'd be helpful. I haven't heard anything about that project being uh, canceled or anything like that. And that's that's a four to three conversion below Broadway for a number of blocks. I, I believe that's still going forward. And frankly, don't I'm not even quite sure what happened last year to delay it. Right, I, I, I don't have the um, latest exact details, um, but my understanding and assumption is that it will be installed in the spring. Super. Great. With that, it's 5.59. Uh, one last call for questions. Seeing none, thank you very much, Chris, for the update. I think this is really a great project. I, uh, I, I, I'm up in this area a lot, and I, I think that it could present some confusion as to what's going on, but uh, definitely what's happening uh, across from Farview it's six is fantastic. Great. And just one more plug. Um, since I won't be coming back for 30%, I, I just thought of this. Now that we're recording all these meetings and we're doing so for the pedestrian advisory committee as well, you can get my presentation for them at 30% if you want more detail on anything like this. So if you ever want more detail on something that's not coming through, just reach out to Matthew Millicent or I and we can get through those videos for you. Okay, we're about ready to wrap this up. Are there any announcements? If not, uh, thank you everybody for uh, attending. We'll see you next Wednesday at our regular meeting and uh, uh, have a good week.
Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.